So to begin, I just wanted to give a definition of low impact development. Um, so this is a stormwater management strategy that seeks to mitigate the impacts of increased runoff and stormwater pollution by managing runoff as close to its source as possible. So to accomplish this, it uses practices that help to preserve or restore the pre-development condition. Um, so these can be um, structures that filter, infiltrate, detain, retain um, the stormwater that falls onto the ground. And another benefit of LID practices is that they can effectively remove sediment and contaminants um, that often gets into runoff and they reduce the volume and intensity of stormwater flows. The city retained a consultant, Aquafor Beach, to help develop an LID screening tool with the following objectives. The first objective was to identify areas where the implementation of LID measures will be the most beneficial, and also areas where they should be precluded, discouraged, or not implemented. The second was to develop a fully automated GIS-based screening tool process to improve efficiency and consistency and aid city staff to conduct systematic reviews of a large number of right-of-ways on a regular basis. And the third objective was to identify, identify candidate projects that demonstrate potential for the implementation of LID measures. So in order to accomplish this as a first step, a decision matrix that considers um, five subwatershed health metrics was used to determine the location of priority subwatersheds. So this figure shows the results of the subwatershed prioritization, which was identified as that first step and was based on the subwatershed health metrics. So priority one subwatersheds are shown in the lightest green color and these ones are the ones with the poor with poor overall health and in the most need of um, of help such as LID implementation. The priority four subwatersheds are shown in the darkest green and these ones are the ones with the best overall health. So this figure is showing in yellow the location of the limits of the uh, reconstruction works that were planned. Um, it also shows on the side to the right, it shows the priority and the rank of uh, that came out of the screening tool, as well as a list of the constraints um, and opportunities. So in conclusion, this automated GIS screening tool for right-of-way LID measures assists the city to effectively and efficiently prioritize candidate right-of-way projects for LID implementation. Um, and the city continues to work on integrating the screening tool into its infrastructure renewal program. So the tool can, could be applied in different locations. And so say if it was in Coburg, um, so it would just be a difference of what data you're entering into the screening tool. Um, so, so based on, you would add in your geographic specific data for the, the, the municipality that you're looking for. And based on the characteristics within that area that you're looking at, this tool can identify the areas um, where LID can work because it doesn't work. It doesn't work everywhere. So it'll identify the places that it can work and where you will get the most benefit. So one of the pieces being um, just identifying where, where within our municipality do we really need to focus on? Like where do we, where do we see the most, um, I guess, impact directly to our water courses? Um, so that's that would be that would be how it would be used. Does the tool identify um, targets in terms of like stormwater quality and quantity that might be beneficial in terms of sizing the uh, LIDs? No, so that that would be, I think, um, 
something that would happen after the tool is used. So the idea behind the tool is it identif identifies the best locations for LID and it identifies what LID features would be possible. And then, and then that can then be taken to uh, look at in a more in-depth fashion to look at what are the specific targets for this location what's the sizing going to look at like that would I guess we provide the information would kind of create the project charter and then that would come as part of the kind of getting closer to the design um, and the data uh, is that stored like is that just shown as a map or is that like stored as like attribute data that the um, the user can access yeah, so it's a whole GIS database. Um, so it, it's a, a full like database of GIS files and whatnot. So um, here's just kind of a, a basic overview of uh, uh, kind of what comprises a digital twin. Um, it doesn't have everything. Um, after listening to Barbara's presentation, I realized I'm missing the vegetation and probably the <laughs> The riverways, but basically you have a terrain layer um, that's going to be a continuous kind of surface that that uh, shows you the changes in elevation. For example, a building layer, which kind of um, acts as the kind of main uh, structural layer of your digital twin. Um, you have mobility and infrastructure kind of built in there, so the road networks and the pipes and sewage. Um, you can also integrate sensors into digital twins, uh, and that's what uh, I think Jonathan was uh, really um, identifying as something key right now, uh, and how we can incorporate Internet of Things, which is um, basically all the, the sensors and, and uh, physical devices that are now uh, co collecting continuous data but are uh, connected to the cloud, so to the Internet, so they can all kind of talk to each other. And, and then even incorporated in, into a digital twin, we now have these different layers that, that can interact. Um, and then um, the kind of end goal is to visualize and simulate um, uh, different phenomena in, in, a, in a city, for example, flooding. So um, we are particularly interested in uh, the building layer, so how we can reconstruct that layer, um, but at scale. So, so it's uh, one thing to kind of go in and look at a single building, um, and there's, there's a lot of software that you can go and if you have some kind of basic measurements, you can go in and, and make a very accurate model of a building, but those methods aren't scalable, so you can't do it for thousands of buildings um, in, a, in a city and even provincial level or beyond. So we want to use scalable methods. That means we can use things like ge geospatial data, which um, have widespread coverage and try to take advantage of that to build our models. And then we want to visualize and simulate um, flood risks or flood uh, different flood scenarios in a city and see how that affects the buildings. First thing you have to think about is what level of detail you you want for your model. So that's important because maybe you just want a simple model. That's all you need for your application, uh, and you just need a simple block model, and that would take up way less space and and resources. So so if that's all you want, then then that's something easy to get. Um, but if you want to do something like uh, uh, understand the solar potential of a city um, and where solar panels are optimal, you, you're going to need information about the roof. So, um, for example, what kind of roof type, the slope and the aspect. Um, and then what we're interested, or at least for my research, uh, we want to find ways to get information on the building facade. So where are the windows and where are the doors? So that's the on the right image, the LOD3. That's the kind of more complex model that, that uh, you can uh, reconstruct. So why does that matter? For a uh, flood risk assessment, if you have like this base flood elevation in a city, um, whether or not you have a raised first floor, so if you have a, a, a higher foundation, it's going to affect your risk. So you can see the building on the, the left is going to have a higher risk uh, for its contents being destroyed during a flood because the first floor is on the ground compared to the right. But if our, if our model doesn't have that information, then all three of these buildings are going to have the same risk. Um, so we want to have this detail in our model so we can automatically um, kind of more accurately assess the risk of the buildings in the city. So kind of the first basic simple way to build a 3D model of uh, buildings in a city is using building footprints. And this is just the polygon shape of, of every building in a city. Um, and it's available for most of the urban areas in Canada. So um, 
It's on open maps and you also have pretty good information. A lot of the building footprints include things like the uh, minimum and maximum elevation. So basically how high is the building? And that's important because we can use the building footprints and just extrude them, just bring them up to the height that's given for each building. Um, and this can be done um, for buildings uh, in entire cities and, and really quickly, and you get these block models. So OpenStreetMaps actually has done this for 350 million buildings. So I went in to their Cetium uh, platform, which is just an open source online uh, kind of viewer of 3D data. Um, and this is these are 3D tiles, that's the data format. Uh, so here's Coburg, um, and I just went in to check it out, and they have uh, a mixture. You have some lots of uh, just simple block models, but you can see some of the buildings um, have been modeled a little bit more accurately. And uh, I think these, this is you guys over here. I hope I got the building right. Um, so yeah, it, once we have that, we've extruded the, the kind of building footprint. Now we have this block model. Um, we, there's other ways then to get uh, to model the rooftops. So um, in this example, it's just uh, a procedural model, which means it's just using rules to model the roof. So it knows if it knows the roof type, if it has information about slope, then you can just uh, kind of use that to um, follow some rules and then uh, model the rooftop. Um, and so now you have a bit more of an, a realistic kind of uh, model and you can add a flood layer and kind of see, begin to see kind of the capabilities of uh, the, the 3D city model. But what I'm mostly interested in, what's a little bit more difficult to obtain is uh, information about the, the windows and doors. And particularly like where the first floor elevation is, because that for us, uh, for flood risk assessment is the kind of key thing. Uh, so if we break that down into uh, two components, we have our uh, LOD2, which is on the left. So I've already talked about that. Um, and then we want to put um, windows and doors. We want to somehow bring them into 3D space and then merge that with uh, our LOD2 uh, to get our final model. So there's different ways to do this. So this is just the kind of pipeline I'm following based on from these authors down here, uh, which basically takes an input image. Um, and from this image, we want to uh, extract information about where is the window and door. But like I said, we want to do this at scale. So we can't just go in and manually trace where the windows and doors are. And instead, we want the computers to do it for us because we have uh, a lot of um, really strong artificial intelligence uh, algorithms for doing this. Artificial intelligence AI is really good at working with images. So um, with a little bit of effort and a little bit of knowledge, you can kind of uh, train, retrain those algorithms to work for your task, which in this case is segmenting. It's a segmentation problem. And we want to identify the pixels in the image that belong to an object. And in our case, it's windows and doors. So uh, just to give you an idea of what is a segmentation model, this is um, a model that was released by Meta AI or formerly Facebook. It was released like a month ago and has just exploded. It's, it's one of the most powerful segmentation models in AI. So it was trained on 10, I think like 10 million images and with 1.1 billion masks. So by masks, I mean the um, in, this, in this kind of, uh, um, Animation, you can see the different colors represent a different mask, which is a different segment. So this is just a generalized uh, model, um, but it, it doesn't need to be retrained. It can work on any image. And actually, you can go to this link and just put your own image in, um, and it works. And the, the code is you can use this model. It's open source in a way, um, and they have the weights available for you. So you can actually go and further uh, use this in your own workflow and retrain it and um, to work with your own data. So now we have our segmented openings. Um, and if we know something about the camera location, um, and in this case, we have actually multiple images of the same building. So we can use uh, photogrammetry, which is basically uh, a way to, uh, if you know where the object is in the different images, um, you can, uh, and you know that where the camera is located and kind of the real world coordinates. So uh, the location and the height and the angle and orientation then you can actually use that um, to 
uh, bring the objects in the, the images into 3D space. So that's, what, that's how we can kind of bring those windows and doors that we've identified into 3D space. So that means we've got windows and doors in 3D space. We can merge it all together for our final model. And, uh, and now you see the potential for um, flood risk assessment and how not only is it a good way to visualize, um, but if you can picture this then uh, at the city scale, you can actually run uh, analyses and, and just um, automatically detect what's going on and where the risk is, uh, which buildings are going to have uh, more issues than others, um, and so on. So that's basically all I wanted to share. Uh, here's the open source 3D resources that I've been using. Uh, there's a lot more, but this is um, kind of a good starting point. It's, it was all pretty much available to anyone. You just need to know a little bit about how how to work it all, and uh, and then yeah, you can build your own models and uh, and pipelines. So thank you again for uh, inviting me and. Here are some references. No, it's crazy to think it's already 10 years since the big July 8 storm in 2013 that happened in Toronto. And this is a, a result of flooding. Um, people being stranded on a train. There's, you can see a boat out there. They had to actually go and rescue people from the train using boats to get them to higher ground. Um, so really, you know, when we talk about flooding and we talk about managing flooding, it's a pretty big concern for, for municipalities, for cities, towns, uh, conservation authorities. So they're trying to keep people safe uh, around our rivers and creeks. Um, usually we do this by sort of regulating development. And so what that means is if somebody wants to build a home right next to the river, we tell them no. Um, because we know when we've seen in the past when we get these big storms, your house is going to flood. It's going to be bad news for everybody involved. But this is where we use models. Um, you, you know, we, we have systems, open source systems that we can uh, use to understand where flooding is going to happen. Um, we use these for things like stormwater management so that we can understand, you know, further to Barbara's um, presentation, when water hits the ground, where is it going to go? How do we capture some of that water so it doesn't just go right into the river? How do we make sure it's clean? All of those things, and there's models and there's tools, open source tools out there um, that are available that you can download from online and kind of plug and play. I mean, they're not super straightforward. That's where it gets a little more complex, but there is open source tools to, uh, available to be able to do that. So when we use this open data, um, a lot of the data that, that we collect, um, so if we're talking about a river, let's say, a lot of municipalities or conservation authorities are, are constantly monitoring the level of water in the river um, or, or the flow that's going down the river. Uh, Scott, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, precipitation monitoring, so having tools on site to measure the rain that's actually happening. And a lot of the, the um, municipalities and others that are doing this data collection are providing that information and uploading it to the cloud so everybody can access. Um, and then we, you know, so we have this past sort of data collection, and then we have our future. So we have our weather forecast, as I was talking about, what's going to happen in the next two to 24 hours. And then we take that information and we upgrade and update our models to predict what's going to happen in two hours. Uh, where is it going to flood? Um, and make a lot of predictions and, and, and understand what the impacts of a, a big storm coming in, let's say, will be on our community. Uh, so this is the type of, of output that we get from the system. So this is a 2D map, not a 3D map. And I think it ties well into Andrea's presentation. Uh, so this would, would show you, um, you know, based on a color-coded map, how deep the water we think is going to um, the flood. And, you know, usually you have your sort of river and it's always flowing. And then when we can predict how how deep the water is and where the extent of that flooding is going to occur. Um, so this is good if we overlay it with something like a building layer. So, so 
similar to, to Andrea, if we know where the buildings are, we know how close they are to the river and we can understand how much that river is going to flood, we can see which of those buildings will interact with the river. So this is a, another output from that tool using a lot of open data sources like the buildings. We know where the buildings are. We know where the rivers are. We know how much rain is coming. So we can see, you know, all of the buildings highlighted in red are those that are going to be susceptible to flooding during these storm events. And we can have depths and you could even pair it with Andrea's um, uh, model to see, okay, the depth's going to be this level against this particular building. We have windows here, doors here. We know, you know, you potentially use that information to understand which buildings are going to be most impacted by this flooding. Um, and, and yeah, so it's a, a very neat tool, good tool to understand where do we want to send our, our teams to maybe, you know, do some sandbagging or close roads or close trails close to these water courses so that people aren't walking down these trails and get swept away by floodwaters, things like that that have a real practical application for tools like this. All right, so IoT. Um, I'm going to do one slide. You guys can all you can you can listen if you want, but this is mostly for the older people in the room. Okay, what is an IoT device? Okay, so an IoT, the Internet of Things. All right, it describes a network of physical objects or things that are embedded with sensors, software, and other technologies for the purpose of connecting and exchanging data with other devices and systems over the internet. So, what is it? It's a bunch of monitoring nodes. We're putting sensors on those monitoring nodes. We're taking that data and we're pushing it to the cloud, okay? So really the idea is any device, anywhere, anybody can have access to it. Um, we can use, uh, we can monitor, we can look at pathways, network pathways, all different things that we can do that makes this data, you know, available and accessible to absolutely anybody. Uh, for the purposes of climate change, um, you know, what we're looking at, we're looking at a variety of different angles from climate change. We're looking at it from smart transportation. We're looking at it from waste management. We're looking at it from sustainable energy grids. And we're looking at it from the climate and the environmental monitoring in general, right? So we're bringing all of these aspects of everyday life, bringing it to the cloud and making that data available to everybody. So, okay, so what is an IoT device? The idea being is that an IoT device is modular, okay? This is an example of an IoT device. I can pick it up, I can move it, I can walk with it, I can relocate it. So the idea is, is that, well, so back in, back in my day, when I first started doing this, we usually had one climate station, right? We had one big physical climate station. It was static. We measured everything at that one point in time. And then that day that was either recorded or if we got really fancy, we put it out by a satellite or something like that. But it was always static. It was in one place at one time. The idea behind the IoT devices is that you actually build networks, okay? And networks gives you this spatial coverage of data. What it gives you is more data. And everybody loves more data, okay? Um, there's, well, you laugh, it's true. <laughs> Sometimes more data is bad, but we'll get into that later. Um, but yeah, so what these networks do is basically it gives you the ability to expand or expand your spatial character or your collection points, how you're collecting the data and where you're collecting the data. The idea being that these are low cost of ownership, cheap, okay? You want more sensors and more platforms, you don't want to pay a lot of money. I can sell a satellite climate station that's designed to go in the Arctic, and I'm going to sell it for $100,000. That's what it's going to cost, okay? I can sell a platform like this for 900 bucks, okay? So you look at the idea being that the low cost, you can expand the network, you can get more for your dollar value. Everybody wants that, right? So IoT is given it that, given that ability. So the low cost of ownership, there's really, there's no subscription fees, there's no internet connection required, there's really no cellular connection required. And I'll show you how we do that in a minute. Uh, it's user friendly, really anybody can set these up, plug and play, that's the idea, okay? Um, so easy installation, low maintenance, and effectively they're ready to use, all right? We've got web apps, we've got um, Android apps, basically the ability to collect and generate and, and collate that data anywhere easily. 
So what you really need for something like this to operate is one of these. This is the gateway, okay? And for anyone who understands point-to-point -point gateway, this is the point of failure, effectively, but also the point of connection. So as long as that's connected to the internet, you've got every, basically every node within that network connecting and communicating in real time. So there's a variety of different network architectures that go into IoT uh, devices. So uh, you can ignore the red X. This is a bit of a sales slide. Cut and paste, but it gives a good, it gives a good uh, idea about what's going on here. So we've got three real you know, existing types of networks out there. You've got point-to-point -point networks. So basically, you've got a measurement point and a data aggregation point. So point-to-point, -point, singular, nothing in the middle, OK? You've got GSM networks. So a GSM network is effectively a cellular network, OK? We're looking at it. Basically, all of that data is going to one singular source, that singular source being the cellular connection, the tower. All right, and then from there, it's posted and plopped up to the internet. The last way to do it is through what we call a tree network or a star network. And what that is, is basically you've got one central point and multiple remote stations will communicate to that central point and that central point becomes the aggregator. That's the point where the data is sent to the cloud and everything is hosted through there. So you can see the expansion capacity point to point, not really a lot of expansion capacity. You have one point to one point. GSM, you've got the ability to have multiple nodes or multiple set points of measurement sent out to the cloud, but it costs a lot of money. You're paying for cellular fees. You're paying for a lot of different aspects to get that connection out. And you're also reliant. In Canada, I mean, y'all, everyone looks at their phone. We've got cellular connectivity in Coburg, Ontario. But I mean, you go 40 minutes outside of an urban area in Canada, there's no cellular connectivity, right? I mean, we were talking, one of the questions earlier was talking about, um, you know, coding the data and getting it out. I mean, the complexities of that, like Matt, Matt kind of answered the question, but the complexities of that are unreal. I mean, we do satellite stations where we, not to get into the weeds, but I could, I mean, we get into data compression. So we actually make this, the files a lot smaller by compressing the message, which means on the back end, on the cloud side of things, you actually have to take that data and uncompress it. So you have to have a software that can decode that message. Now we do that because satellite's expensive. Okay, so the bigger a data packet that goes out via satellite, the more expensive your bill is going to be. So if we can compress that message and then open it up on the back end, that's a nice way to do it too. Um, and yeah, the tree network side of it, obviously multiple nodes, but you can get into it. Star the star setups are basically a central point of failure. So what we've developed is effectively this mesh IoT system. And what a mesh system is is basically. It's basically a tree or a network, but every node is also a repeater. So that entire network has unlimited geographical connectivity. And to give you an example, I have a buoy network that runs through Lake Ontario. I have a buoy. The furthest east that we have a buoy is just outside the port of Oshawa. I have seven buoys along the lakefront. The one in the port of Oshawa talks to the port of Scarborough. The Port of Scarborough then talks to the Port of Oakville. The Port of Oakville talks to the Port of Burlington. The Port of Burlington talks to the Port of Hamilton. And then from the other side, from Niagara, we run all the way up St. Catharines. So there's nine buoys that talk to each other in real time. That aggregate, the data gets aggregated at DFO in Hamilton, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Canadian Center for Inland Waters. And they take all of that data. That's all your real time water quality data with the province and with the feds. And it's all done through this network architecture. So one point all the way through. So the nice part about it is, is like I said, you can create basically infinite size networks. And we're talking, I mean, that's 75, 80 kilometers of shoreline. That's all networked through one, one configuration network. OK, so what are we doing with IoT devices in the real world? What, how are we using these? Well, I mean, essentially, the sky's the limit, right? I mean, I can do forest fire monitoring research. I can do it in real time. I can look at CO2 levels in fires. We can look at hot spots, dry spots. We can do a bunch of different things on that side of things. We can look at real time residential conditions. So what does that mean? Well, I mean, that could be everything from your sump pump in your house, right? To, I mean, this, this caricature talks about your recycling bins and your garbage bins and all those things in between, right? We can monitor absolutely everything. It's a little scary, a little terrifying, I'm not gonna lie, but we can do it. 
I can look at your gas meter in your house. I can do all of these things, put all this data out to the cloud. And then from a water quality and flow perspective, we can do absolutely everything from in situ water quality to flow, flood forecasting all the way through, real-time precipitation monitoring. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So the idea behind these IoT devices is, is they're simple, okay? They're easy to use, they're easy to integrate. Um, so you get a high quality of service. Basically what you have is a very a, a, a uptime of almost 100%. So basically the stations should never go down. They're autonomous, they work on their own. The smarts and logistics are built into it. So it smarts, it, it routes the data based on the way you, or based on the passive path of least resistance. Uh, so that they, they gives you long range, wide area network capacity. They're flexible, they're scalable, and they're low cost. So that's really what defines the IoT market. So what does an IoT network look like? I mean, it can be everything from handheld units to repeaters for industrial monitoring. It can be ultrasonic water levels for ports and harbors. You can look at, um, what else we got on there? Gas pressure. So in terms of you know, flow and gas pressure, either from a house or residential building. Piezometers, so you can do groundwater and tank monitoring uh, in real time, uh, and as well as remote controls. So ultimately, we can take whatever sensor is built and build that into a real time platform off of this uh, off of this option. So just to give you a quick little example of what we did with these units, so that we did 250 wireless monitoring devices, effectively focused on dewatering of the Eglinton line. Now, I'm from City of Toronto, so you know. Forgive me for thinking Toronto is the center of the universe, but that's okay. That's my example. Um, what it is is effectively the uh, the TTC is expanding the Eglinton uh, subway line. So you can imagine you've got a subway line. It's below ground. One of the major concerns in the city of Hamilton or city of Toronto, I should say, is A, the aging infrastructure aspect, and B, how do we manage high water flow events? Matt showed a great picture. Uh, I think it was 20, 2008 was that GO train picture, right? So the city of Toronto experiences this more regularly now than we have in previous years. We call them one in 25, one in 50 year, one in 100 year storms. And you know, the one in 100 year storm is happening more than one in 100 years now, right? That's the one in 100 is becoming one in 50, and one in 50 is becoming one in 25, right? So one of the major concerns of the construction side of it is obviously subway line below ground. We wanna make sure that we dewater or remove the water while we're doing the construction side of it. Also from a flow perspective, making sure no surface water flow gets into that submerged um, uh, subway line. So we put 250 of these units basically all the way along the, uh, the Eglinton line from start to finish. And every one of them networked back all the way through. So we had real time data for absolutely everything from a dewatering process that was going on. Now, I could use these nodes to basically do anything from surface water flow. We do a lot in terms of, uh, in terms with conservation authorities, we do a lot with uh, I mean, Matt's group and other consultants from Civica and so on and, and municipalities as well. In terms of taking all of this data, whether it be precipitation, climate flow and turning it into these, these, these available networks of data. So another way to look at it is, you know, from the IoT side is looking at climate data. And obviously climate and, and weather, real-time weather, is really what's driving a lot of our systems responses, right? We look at our municipal infrastructure and we say, okay, it's raining, you know, it's raining a lot today, right? And, and you know, how is our system gonna be able to take that information in real time and make decisions, whether it be, capping a stormwater flow pond, whether it be opening up sewer lines or under, underground infrastructure that's gonna take that real-time information and, and make operational decisions with it. So what does a climate IoT system look like? Well, truthfully, again, the origins of climate systems used to be one main static system. This is your climate, this is at one specific location. Now, we have the ability to basically network in all of these sensors across massive platforms. And I'll give you an example in a bit. So what do we be able to collect? Well, we can collect in situ soil moisture data. We can collect temperature and relative humidity. We can collect rainfall. What else? Wind speed and direction, leaf wetness, right? We can look at leaf wetness. I mean, they were talking this morning about the LID systems, right? Low impact development setups, right? You can look at in situ soil moisture. You could have an entire monitoring system in your LID platform 
we can look at all the ways that moisture is being used, captured and collected and disseminated within that little LID platform. Barometric pressure, water level, calculated evapotranspiration, where you can do pulse inputs, which is really just a tipping bucket. So from that, we can create all these different nodes. So effectively, the sky's the limit. You can take um, a complete monitoring setup and instrument every aspect of that monitoring system utilizing a variety of different configurations. And one of the nice parts about an IoT climate system is really the cloud service side of it, okay? So you're only as good as your cloud system because if your cloud system isn't working, you're not gonna have any data to display, right? So what's the idea? Well, you've got 24 seven web access to your data. It's completely customizable. You can look at different ways of visualizing that data. You know, you've got end users that wanna see certain aspects and users that wanna see calculations, right? You can take all that raw data and do complete calculations and have visualization on that. Uh, you can have, you know, ideas on status of your systems. Is a node working? Is it not working? You know, what's wrong with it? Battery level, that kind of stuff. Uh, you can have alarms. I mean, it's amazing what you can do with alarms and how out of control people can go with alarms very quickly, right? Everybody wants to know when their station isn't working. And then we typically configure alarms for people. And then they come back to me a week later and say, eh, I don't really want that much alarm, right? Because you, you can do alarms, high level, low levels, all these different types of configurations. Um, you can create customized dashboards and you can do a lot of different calculations with all of this. So. Uh, the cloud configuration, that's another nice aspect of IoT platforms is you can effectively configure everything remotely. So what have we basically done? Well, might go back to my example at the beginning of sitting in the, you know, the side of the forest in, in, in Wood Buffalo National Park, right? If I wanted to configure my data logger to monitor all of my parameters, I had to physically be there. I had to change it. I had to connect to it. I had to reprogram it. I had to do all these different things physically there. The idea between I with IoT is that you don't have to be there, right? You can configure, you can make changes, you can do anything you want to that station in real time while not being there. If I pulled out my phone right now, I could show you the real-time data, the buoy I put in the ocean last week. I could, on my phone, reprogram that buoy and not tell anybody, and we would have either data stopped all the way through. Now there's security and passwords and all the rest, and obviously I wouldn't do that, but... You can do that now. And that's the neat part about these two-way communication platforms. And then lastly is the cloud data visualization. So what do you get? You get auto-generated dashboards, you get customizable dashboards, and basically you can share all of this data via a public URL. So you can make all of this data, some of this data, only certain parameters of this data available to the general public, okay? And you can see a bunch of data visualization on the side here. So here's an example of a climate monitoring in an agricultural system. So what you've got here is you basically got a massive production facility, all right, with a whole bunch of different monitoring nodes going everywhere. And then you've got these remote nodes. So basically, they're monitoring every one of their fields, okay? So they're looking at different grades. They've got wheat. They've got corn. They've got soy. Whatever they've got in their field, you're actually collecting all of these nodes remotely, and they're all communicating back to a central logger and pushing it out to that aggregator. So this entire farm is effectively networked. So here's the data in real time from 1010. So the last, the last time it connected up, you can see all of this data in real time right on the platform from every one of those nodes in the farm field. You can see um, Fahrenheit collections, data uh, of soil temperature, wind speed and direction solar radiation, wind gust, where that direction of the gust is, inches of mercury for your barometric pressure. Everything is in real time and everything is posted to that website. So this data is completely accessible, completely shareable. And then there's a whole graph section. So you can visually look at all of the data in real time. So this farm is actively able to make decision making on everything from where are we gonna water? How are we going to utilize the water we have available in our farm and make decisions on which crops get moisture? With these independent moisture values in the soil, we can say, well, the soil really does, the, the soil in the soy field is actually really dry right now. So maybe we need to target our watering in that specific field. So you can make use, make smart decisions based on the availability of water and the localized conditions to, to, to really better manage your agricultural setup.
you know, where are we using these, right? So what are we doing with the air quality? Well, I mean, smart cities and ports, that's kind of where everything is going nowadays because everyone's looking to have integrated data or real-time data for smart city management and port management. So basically, what are we doing? We're working with a variety of, um, of, of different ports and cities across the world, uh, Montreal specifically here in Canada, looking at, you know, in the port of Saguenay as well. I think it's on my next slide. But um, looking at different air ways that we can monitor air quality, right? And what are the industrial impacts of the local area and how are we seeing those impacts in real time from a public and human health perspective? So a lot of interest, obviously, in the human health side of it is looking at public health within schools, right? So, you know, what kind of, what kind of conditions do you have in your schools? And then obviously transferring that over to buildings and offices, right? So the entire point is that you can have any sensor anywhere, anytime via this IoT platform. And that's basically what I do. So it's kind of cool. That's set up for that farms probably in the order of like 25 or 30K. That's it. So, which, I mean, that's good that you reacted that way. Some people react the other way. Like, oh my God, that's the price of a car. But what they're gaining, exactly. Yes, that's, that's a good way to look at it. I like it. But the advantages that they're getting from that, right, in terms of their production capacity, how they're going to, how their crops are going to grow, right? And we're seeing a lot of this in southwestern Ontario where greenhouses are converting once all the paperwork's filled in and all the good things have been done with the government. They're converting these tomato greenhouses over to these, um, you know, cash crop level greenhouses, right? And all of this instrumentation, they're going into effectively managing their crop production, right? Because at the end of the day, the, the, the money for them is, is, is worth it, right? They're getting their back end. They're getting a much higher yield. They're getting a whole bunch of other aspects that are going into it, right? So everything that we've been learning today is about, like, data, right? How do we take data and help our cities build more livable and sustainable communities? So quickly, my background being urban planning, I always dreamt of building a solution for our cities that can help us be proactive rather than reactive. So before the floods come, before the earthquakes happen, how can we actually visualize them? In something called JSON format, and we plug it into our, our, our digital twin environment. And what we're adding now, so for example, they're building the Portland's area here. And because there's an airport really close by, a lot of architects and developers are concerned about, okay, what is the height of the building that we can put here? The urban planners, they're, they're spending so much time and man hours uh, trying to go back to these developers and be like, okay, send us your plans. Yes, this, can, this will work. No, this won't. The simplest thing to do is to add um, a, like a license model that we're giving to the Portland's the Waterfront Toronto that they can show developers and architects that once they click on the application and they click on a certain point in the Portland's, it'll tell them, how high their building can be. So it, it's really streamlining the urban planning process. Coming back to the city, there's, so these are the cameras. This is, you can see the live carbon monoxide in the city. You could see particle matter, any kind of air quality data that these sensors are, are calculating, you can bring it into these digital twin environments. We're working on a project right now in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, where a lot of companies Every metric ton of emissions, uh, every metric ton of carbon emissions they emit into the atmosphere, they have to buy a carbon credit for that. So there's a lot of carbon credit companies that need to be able to show where these uh, trees are being planted in order to, to conduct carbon offset. So you could show the reforestation of an entire area, what it'll look like with the time lapse in the digital world. These are the type of animals that are gonna come back. These are, these are the, this is the, the type of greenery and the canopies that you're gonna have within five to 10 years. So it's not just urban environments, it's rural environments as well that need this. Also, we're talking about flood mapping, right? To be able to see what part of the city is going to get affected with the rising water, that's really, really important. So different departments license these applications for different reasons, but what we were able to do and I highly encourage everyone, if you're going to get into, if you're going to create a business around uh, GIS mapping and digital twins, this is the time to do it because there's so much data that's out there. They don't even know how to uh, review it and look at it. So what happens is that they don't have the ability to make decisions quick enough. Bringing all that data out of the silos and into one digital 
visualization platform or a dashboard like this can be amazing. It doesn't just look good, but you can actually make decisions quickly. It's also a good way for Toronto economic development to attract businesses to the city because they could show in real time that, look, these are all, all our educational and academic institutions. These are our residential areas. You could show they have data such as where all the software engineers live, all that kind of information on the same digital twin platform, just with different data sets we can add it quickly. Um, we also have the roads and highways here and adding different scenarios. So simulations is key to be able to show, okay, these are the carbon emissions being emitted from this area. If you were to, re if you were to remove the Gardner Expressway, how would that affect greenhouse gas emissions? Because it's not just Toronto, every city out there is looking for solutions on how they can fight um, you know, uh, carbon emissions, how they can reduce their carbon footprint. And we're looking at it at a, at a grand scale, but if we were to click on a building and bring that data, you can even see the carbon footprint of each individual building. Key, especially in North America, is to be able to work with IoT and data companies, bring that data to life to help decision makers make decisions more effectively and efficiently.